How you doing? <laughs> I've, I've never done this before, just like I was never in the Grammys before. Okay, so I'm going to read you something that was in 100 countries and went to millions of people after my nomination. It was called The Curious Case of Grammy nominee Linda Chorney from the Associated Press. This wonderful guy named Chris Talbot wrote it. Linda Chorney is either the feel-good, do-it-yourself success story of this year's Grammy Awards, or she's an unworthy imposter who broke the unwritten rules regarding self-promotion for music's top showcase. It just depends who you talk to. Uh, anyway, my thing was, I thought was my Cinderella story. After playing in bars for 30 years and waiting to get my break, I finally got my break and I got nominated for a Grammy. I, at 51, I couldn't believe it. Uh, but then what happened is that some people tried to poop in my glass slipper. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, I used, as uh, Eric mentioned before, I used Grammy 365, which a Naris had uh, created a few years ago for independent artists to use as a social uh, media uh, networking. And it worked kind of like Facebook where you have to ask for contacts, but I didn't know anything about it, but that's what got me there. Uh, and I was in a category that uh, legends have been in. Uh, you recognize some of these guys, you might not recognize me. Bob Dylan, uh, Willie Nelson, Robert Plant, these guys are my idols. Okay, and uh, I kind of took the scenic route to the Grammys. I started playing piano when I was four. I played guitar since I was 10 years old, and I've got a bunch of albums. I spent about 10 grand on each album out of my pocket. And of course, I would like to have spent more, but that's all the resources I had, and I used the money from all my gigs to do that. And so all by myself, and then I broke the top 40 in the United States when I was 40 years old, finally, at age 40. And what happened was our uh, little indie label that we had, uh, we couldn't afford the, the uh, radio promotions guy anymore. It cost money to get airplay in, in one form or another. But also what happened when we were getting traction is that two planes hit uh, some uh, buildings and it changed everything that day and when Linda Ragsdale spoke uh, I had one of those moments where I kind of lost it there because I, I was actually in India in Mumbai before the attack happened so that was really something and that day you know even though my career kind of was on a roll and it went down the tubes I thought to myself how important is another song at least I'm alive and it put a lot of things in perspective. So I was like, OK, WTF do I do now, right? So I go back to skiing, uh, singing in ski resorts. I played in ski resorts for a bunch of years. How many skiers do we have here? OK, great. Yeah, woo. Snowboarders, they're out back smoking, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, so. So I played up, uh, I, I made it to the top there anyway. I sang at about 10,000 feet, sucking wind. And my big line was, to everybody was, hey, what do you guys blow about a grand a day skiing? You know, what's another 20 bucks for my CD? So I sold a ton of CDs. So I made, I made a pretty good living. So, you know, I, I, I just had pretty much conceded to the fact that I, it just wasn't in the cards. I wasn't going to make it big. I always believed in myself. I always believed in my music. And I just want to have this opportunity to say to anybody who's listening out there who are musicians and artists. We have artists in the audience here and musicians in the audience up there. Hey, all right. How you doing? <laughs> um, and just there's so much great talent out there that never gets heard. Never. And, and they just don't get their break. It doesn't mean they're not good enough. Because some people say, well, if they were good enough, they would have been famous by now. But that's not true. It's simply not true. There has to be a little something else that has to happen to you. And what happened to me is I got really lucky. And thank goodness for what happened next. And that is, and by the way, so you guys who are playing in bars somewhere just hoping that, oh my gosh, one day, just one day, I'm going to meet that person who's going to come up to me and say, you know what, you've got to be famous, and I happen to own a record company. Let me write you a check. So you never know what's going to happen, but that didn't happen to me. But anyway, <laughs> in, uh, what did happen to me, what did happen to me is that um, 
I met three very important people when I was singing in Colorado. One person uh, said my music inspired her so much, she gave me a pass to fly around the world for seven years. So I flew around the world for seven years in, uh, from 2001 on, for a long time. And then I met this other guy, uh, this other guy who uh, heard me play and he goes, you know, anybody who can keep a bunch of drunk skiers occupied with her original music's got something good and uh, I want to buy all of your CDs. And he and I became friends and I'll talk about him in another second. Um, and, and then this other guy who stalked me and I fell in love with. And, <laughs> and he was from New Jersey. So anyway, he, he comes up to me and says, Linda, he goes, what you have to, he goes, your music is great. What you have to do is you have to network socially. You've got to put it on Facebook and Reverb Nation and, and Twitter, and, and you have to have a blog. You've got to have a blog. That's why they talk in Jersey. It's kind of like that. <laughs> so anyway, I was like, ah, I don't want to do any of that stuff. I'm so tired. I am so sick and tired of, of knocking on doors and going, oh my god, look at me. I'm great. I'm great. Uh, you should listen. You get tired of that. Even though you know you're good, you believe in yourself, you just don't believe in the business. So anyway, eventually, after he pissed me off from being on Facebook so much, I started my blog, but I wrote about everything else except my music. And, uh, but it was great. I'll tell you, a blog gives you a voice. A blog is free therapy. It really is. You can rant on, on it, you can do whatever you want, and it totally comes in handy if you have to deal with the press, if you want to get your own story in. So. Anyway, I finally wrote the blog, and, and then I met this guy, the rock doc, Dr. Jonathan Schneider, this, the guy who I told you about who said your stuff's really great and uh, I bought all, you know, he bought all my albums. Well, nine years later, he comes up to me and says, Linda, I want you to make the album you've never been able to make before. I'm going to give you $50,000 to make the album that you've always wanted to do. And I said, you're joking, right? He goes, no, I want you to do it. So I accepted the offer, and I went together, and I got together the best musicians. Lisa Fisher from the Rolling Stones. She's toured with them for 18 years. Sean Pelton from Saturday Night Live. Leon Pendarvis, the, the music leader of Saturday Night Live. Will Lee, as you guys know from uh, David Letterman Band. Jeff Pivar, amazing. Bashiri Johnson, who's played with everybody under the sun. So I, it was like... I used to be like one of those Norman Rockwell kids in the can against the candy store wall, the freezing wall, <laughs> breathing against all the things I wish I could have because I know how to make that great album, but you only have so much you can deal with. So anyway, I had the whole store. I could do whatever I want. It was fantastic. And I made the album of my dreams. I put together a symphony that I always wanted to write, and I, we weren't really looking for a particular genre. I figured this is my last album. You know, I'm, I'm 50 years old. I'm not going to do another one. I've, this is my sixth one. And I made songs long. I didn't care about airplay. I knew that wasn't going to happen. I, I, put, <laughs> no, I, I have long solos, everything I wanted. It's a blast. Album gets done, emotional jukebox. And my husband says to me, he goes, Linda, he goes, this album is so good, I want you to put it in the Grammys. I'm like, are you out of your mind? This, 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 what am I going to do? Well, no, go to Grammy 365. So this guy, for 100 bucks, it's like a lottery ticket to, to go to. And, but it's designed to get in, uh, independent artists to, to listen to one another, but I don't know if they actually thought one of us would get through. <laughs> but um, <laughs> anyway, so, so uh, you, to qualify, you have to be on X amount of albums, and, and basically that's it, and they have to be distributed in the United States. So we put it out. Uh, we, he joined me up in January. Now, uh, all of a sudden, it comes time for submission. And we don't know what we're doing. But this one guy, Thomas Hutchings, who's my saxophone player in my band, he happens to be a member of NARIS. So he tells me, he goes, Lindy, you have to get contacts. If you don't get contacts, nobody will listen to music. We're like, OK. So again, we didn't know what we were doing, just like I don't know what I'm doing now, doing this presentation. <laughs> I'm just looking at the clock going, oh my god, I can't get this done. So, so anyway, we go on there, we go, go on there, and it is tedious. See these pagers on the contacts, the member directly, there's 12 people per page here, right? And uh, 523 pages. So we had 6,000, over 6,000 people we had to write to, and there were two weeks left. I am a procrastinator. So anyway, we, we just bust our butts, though. This is it. This is my chance. And, and my fire was lit under me when I had, already, I had submitted eight categories 
for this album. I figured, oh, what the hell, I'll put an album of the year, why not, you know? I don't have a chance in hell of doing any of this, so well, let's throw it in there. So, uh, so I stuck it in, and, and then uh, the, the paper comes back, you know, the official paper, and oh my gosh, there's my name on all of them. And that's when I said, ooh, my name's on there, I have a shot. So we went on there and we wrote every single person and we got about 1,500 people to call me back. And you have to ask for consideration. You can't ask them to vote for you. There's rules. And, and that's all you do, consideration, consideration. You hear it all the time. But uh, at the same time that you are being considered, you're also listening to other people's music. And there's great music on there. OK, so I'm up against Emmy Lou Harris. Los Lobos, John Hyatt, the late Levon Helm, uh, uh, Lucinda Williams, Ry Cooter, and the dude, Jeff Bridges. <laughs> and I figured there's, there's no way there's a wild card slot, because only five people get chosen out of the 165 that were in there. And these guys are ringers. There's no way it's going to happen. So anyway, I put it in. And give me a drum roll, everybody. November 30th. Oh, I, I, November 30th, bada bing! There I am, my first name, Linda Chorney, and I freaked out. I couldn't believe my husband and I were jumping around doing the happy dance. It was unbelievable, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be the greatest, finally, after playing in bars for 30 years. I, I was just stunned. I said, but now what do we do? You right? Well, I wrote my, <laughs> I wrote my blog that night. And then, uh, and then I get a letter from a publicist. Like it was, I'm on auto, automatic pilot. Hi, Linda, congratulations on your nomination in the Americana category. How awesome is that? My company, one of the leading publicity companies, uh, you know, Americana genre, they lo love to talk. I changed his name because he is a dick. OK, so then, <laughs> thank you. Because the next day, the next day I wake up, you know, I'm having sugar plum dreams. I wake up the next day, and I get this from him. Uh, Hi, Linda, I'll call you. But as it turns out, it looks like we're pretty full up, whatever the hell that means, for projects leading into the Grammy Awards. Anyway, perhaps I can recommend a colleague or two. Well, he recommends somebody. Um, and who? <laughs> He recommends somebody who calls me and says, I love your story. Your story's fantastic. I want to work with you. I don't want to charge you anything. This is great. This is great. I'm like, oh, awesome. This is fantastic. So, uh, so we take her on. She goes, I've got everybody calling me off the hook. Variety's calling me. Billboard, you name it. This is fantastic. OK, great. So then I get a phone call from her the next day. She's like, ah, uh, ah, uh, you, you realize uh, you really don't belong here, right? I'm like, what? She goes, you know, you know you're not as good as these other people in the category, that you're just a joke. And we're like, oh, geez, now what? So, so we don't know what to do. So we, uh, but then she calls up and she says, you know what, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I was just had a bad moment. Everybody's giving me crap for representing you. And so it's like the other publicists. Apparently, and th this is just my theory, is that um, because other people spent a lot of money on their publicists to get their people nominated, and they didn't get nominated, and I did that the publicists didn't like me. So they did what they could to, to do what they could, and it worked <laughs> pretty much. OK, so anyway, we flew over to LA to meet her, and everything looked like it was pretty cool. That's me, because I'm an independent. I'm not even an indie. I'm an Audi. I don't even have, I don't even have the budget for a, an artist, so I drew that. We go to LA, and we meet her. <laughs> And I, I did the interview with Billboard and with Variety, and it's really awesome. And, uh, and then we're, we're leaving Los Angeles, and we're flying home, and uh, I've got Variety with me, and I'm on the cover. I made the cover, the hard cover of Variety. I'm like, oh my god, this is amazing. And, uh, and then we had to make an emergency landing. The plane had a problem. So that was my next WTF now. And, um, and so that's me drinking. That's a picture of me drinking, holding the thing after we had the emergency landing. And, uh, and then, and then the, the article says, nobody in our field, managers, booking agents, radio promoters knows who the this chick is. So I was laughing. I thought that was hysterical. And I decided to go with it. And I made t-shirts. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, thank you. Which are available, which are available. And, uh, and then, and then um, the other guy, that other publicist, starts a bullying campaign about me on Facebook. And it's like, wow, that's not really nice. 
So everything was kind of weird. I didn't know what was going on. Then Billboard came up. Everything was cool. I'm running out of time. Houston Press comes out. Uh, and this is when the bashing started. You know, everything was really funny for a while. And then this other uh, um, Roots magazine came up. But this is the kind of journalism they were using. Uh, as far, this is what was actually printed. As far as Pachorni's successful campaign uh, to insinuate her Tepid album into the, fin uh, the finals, Ellis quips, just because you can make a retard dance, don't make it right. What, what, is, what kind of journalism is that? And this other uh, publication actually had the, the audacity to write this. We second Mr. Ellis's opinion. <laughs> Linda Chorney, do the right thing, withdraw your nomination now. Oh yeah, okay, I'm gonna do that. So uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, but then some guy stepped up to the plate. Uh, this guy, Paul Shatkin, he was my hero, and he, and he was wonderful what he said. I'm running totally out of time. Uh, I was on the cover of everything, and then, then misquotes started. I got the misquotes because I was talking about how I, can, how I was influenced by the Beatles and the Stones, and that got turned into Chorney aligns herself with the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. I'm like, oh my God. Press is, press is tough. You gotta, you gotta deal with things. It was an, uh, and I'm gonna run out of time to sing. Do I have to sing now? Okay. Uh, so anyway, um, <laughs> Uh, Philadelphia Inquirer, then I learned about sensationalized uh, marketing. They, this guy wrote this great article, he's a wonderful guy, Dan uh, DeLuca from Philly Inquirer, uh, American Grammy underdog, Grammy nominee sparks social networking. That gets turned into Grammy nominee accused of gaming the system. So they changed things around and, uh, and then there was Venom, oh, I got death threats for being nominated for a Grammy. And then I started looking at search, search engines of what people were searching for for me. Linda Chorney lesbian, Linda Chorney asshole. Linda Chorney knows Bruce Springsteen. Um, you know, Vikram was talking, he had a shot, you know, with uh, his guru guy. I had a shot with me and Springsteen, so I decided to make another blog, make it easy for him. Linda Chorney, lesbian, <laughs> ask Linda Osmond Springsteen. Thank you. Okay. Round two came. The article comes out. Nara said I did nothing wrong. Uh, I'm in the Hollywood Reporter. Some guy calls me up and tells me all the secrets about the AMA, uh, which I can't even get into right now. Um, I go to the Grammys. I don't win the Grammys. But I ended up, uh, th whole, I thought my curse was broken because I got to sing at Na uh, Fenway Park a couple of weeks ago, which was wicked awesome. And then, and then I got invited, I got invited to another conference and guess what they called it? <laughs> Thank you. You're giving me the time to do it? Oh, I, I thought I was done. I, hey, I finished to the second, right? That was cool. So you want to hear something funny? They, you know how they accuse me of gaming the Grammys? I'm really totally bad with, um, with social media and, and computers. And I actually, in Dropbox, all of our speeches were in Dropbox the night before everybody was coming. And now my Dropbox was full, so I said, oh, I'll just get rid of them all. So I erased everybody's speeches. That was me. <laughs> oh, yeah? So I, I, I wrote this song uh, during, during the bullying time. Um, I was inspired to write this called One I Sing. Life has been less than easy. I've been disappointed more than I care to admit. But I put on a good show of color to brush over all the pain. And I don't have enough fingers on my hands to count how many times I've been let down. But I found a safe place to go where I love hanging around. Where I don't feel the sting. And that's just one thing that makes me child on a swing but no one can hurt me when I sing Thank you! There ain't nothing wrong with being your own best friend even though sometimes you feel stuck with yourself, at least you'll be there till the end. 
And you won't walk out on you after you've loved with all your heart. And wipe the feet on you, welcome at not bothering to close the door behind. Leaving you broken in a draft, never bothering to look back. Wondering if you're okay, never questioning how it ended up. How it ended up this way And there's just one thing that Makes me feel As light as a child on a swing No one can hurt me No one can break my heart No one can hurt me When I sing When I sing When I sing